Thank you very much, Glenn. I want to thank you very much for asking me to come on board here today, and I'd like to welcome myself to the uh, to the Glunch Bunch, man. Thanks for having me. I always say there are two of the most spiritual places on the planet. Start with the word the. One of them is the Bronx, and the other one is the Vatican. There you go. That's it, man. I, I am blessed beyond measure. You know, sometimes it's and people ask me how I'm doing, and I'm almost embarrassed to say I couldn't be any better. Uh, my sober date is May 8, 2004. Uh, my home group is the Bronxville Asbury Group in East Chester, New York. My uh, Zoom platform home group is the Delray Beach Noon, as we meet every day at noon at this time. And uh, I may get a point to stay on, stay connected to the rooms of AA. But without it, I'm going to fall back into my old ways, and uh, you know where that gets us. Uh, I am born and raised in the Bronx. I'm one of eight children. Uh, I was raised in an alcoholic zip code. Uh, I started drinking when I was about 12 years old. The whole neighborhood was drinking. It was an Irish Catholic neighborhood. And there was alcohol everywhere. Little League games, softball games, church functions. Alcohol everywhere. Very little consequences. And you're drinking when you're young. You're allowed to drink at home. Which, uh, which There you go. And, uh, and I ran with the people who drank. And as a result, I thought the whole world drank like I did. And only when I came into the room of AA that I realized, no, no, alcoholics drink like I did. And I ran with the alcoholics. I uh, I remember walking into the Parkside Tavern when I was about 16 years old, and I walked out of the Piper's Kilt when I was 48. <laughs> and nothing really good happened in between. Uh, but alcohol and all the destruction that follows that. It was... Uh, I don't know if I was a shy kid or a loud kid or a confident kid. I don't know, but I know when I had that first drink, things just felt a little different for me. And uh, we started drinking Tall Boys and Budweiser on the roof landings with a gigantic bag of onion, garlic, potato chips. But nobody liked the taste of the beer, but we wanted to drink it. And unbeknownst to us, we drank it for the effect. And then I graduated to a court, then a case, and then you do the other stuff. and. I was off and running. I got thrown out of fifth grade for my nice lily white parish, St. Nicholas of Tallentine, but throwing Mrs. Coveney's desk out the window in between classes. I don't recall if I had a beer on me, but I know I had the isms. And me and Brian Conroy got thrown out. And little Anne Marie, never forget Anne Marie. Anne Marie was a classmate of mine, and she had a she had a urinary incontinence problem. She would pee in the classroom all the time. And I would have to go down to the janitor's office to get that green stuff, throw it on the urine, and clean it up. And she ratted me out. And quite frankly, I'm still looking for Amory. So I get thrown out of uh, Tallentown, and I have to go down to the South Bronx now. Down to the South Bronx, I go to a nice uh, all-boys school called All Hollows, about two blocks from Yankee Stadium. And back then, it was a rough neighborhood. It was a mixed demographic. You know, the civil rights movement was kicking in. I'm 66 years of age. So it was a little rough, but uh, I met the guys who drank, the guys who got high, and, uh, you know, you fit right in. You fit right in. Even though there were cultural differences, you know, you fit right in. If you're drinking, you're part of the team. And I drank, and uh, we did okay. And then I graduated from there. I, I didn't get in any trouble, you know, Serious stuff. I wasn't picked up by the law, but I would get jammed up at school and blah, blah, blah. And all because I was drinking, you know. But I never I never associated my drinking with the trouble. Never never even thought about that. So I get I got I graduate from eighth grade from Wall Hollows and I go back to my parish school. And uh, now I'm pretty I'm pretty much a drunk and uh, I get busted the first two dances. Drunk as a skunk, smoking some weed, and I'm on probation. And uh, again, very few consequences at home. You know, you took a smack in the mouth, took a little beating, you grounded for a couple of days, but then you go back out. And I continued to drink. Not a problem. But halfway through freshman year, I get called down to the principal's office. Please escort Mr. Colhane to the principal's office. And that was different. That was different. So on the way down, I asked Mr. Carlos Swano. I said, Mr. C, can I go to the bathroom? 
we have to drop some stuff. And he goes, no, no, you stay with me. And I go down to Father Kelly's office and he asked me to empty my pockets. And this is where alcohol took me and I didn't even realize what was happening. I didn't, I don't even remember how I started. But I had about 40 or 50 second oils and two and oils in my pocket and I had a half a pound of weed in my locker. Now understand this, folks. And I, I look back and it's just stunning to me. I had not yet entered puberty and I'm moving product on the streets of the Bronx. And I don't know when it started. So I get thrown out of school. I took a beating from my old man. I go down to Old Hollows and I'm okay. I'm back home where I'm supposed to be, right? With the drinking and the drugging. And I'm running wild down there. I come home. I'm playing a little basketball for the CYO. And I come home late and mommy don't see me. She got a bunch of other kids and I run upstairs. And I'm in a lot of trouble. But I'm doing good in school. In school. But when I got thrown out of Palatine, I got to go to Wahalos. And they put me in the E class. A being the small people. E, we only had space, was where kids were just learning how to use silverware. <laughs> so I was able to memorize a couple of things out of history books. So my grades were good. So again, on the outside, I looked good. But I was a, I was a, I was a mess. And I go through school. And I apply to colleges. And I get into most of my colleges. Uh, but I am deathly sick, folks. I am deathly sick and I'm deathly afraid. I have suicidal ideation. I'm driving down a major highway on my bicycle, hoping to get crushed by an 18-wheeler. Too afraid to kill myself, but didn't want to live. But uh, I'm up in my room and I, I am I'm on a verge of a nervous breakdown. I'm transparently thin. I'm in the throes of drug and alcohol addiction. I say, I got to get out of New York. And I realized when I come into AA, that was my first geographic move. If I get out of New York, it's the neighborhood that's bad. So I go into my college bag. I had all these brochures. I had a brother, Edward. He came down from Manchester, New Hampshire. It was a Benedictine college run by the monks up in Manchester. And he comes down to the South Bronx, a small little school, 200 students. And he hands me a brochure. And in mid-August of 1974, I call up this cleric. He said, Brother Philip, you don't know who I am? Brother Philip, his name was. Brother Philip, you don't know who I am? My name's Tommy Cohen. I met you down at Old Hollows. I'd like to go to school up there. He goes, okay. Did you put your application? I go, no, I haven't. He goes, we'll put it in. We'll see you next year. I go, well, no, I can't, Father, uh, brother. I, I, I'm in a, I have a big problem. I need to come up there now. And uh, he goes, what's the problem? You know, it's two weeks to class. And I tell this cleric, who I didn't know from Adam, my entire story, folks. And I'm on the phone and I am crying. I got bubble snot coming out of my nose. I'm heaving. And uh, I tell him about the sexual abuse, the alcohol and drug abuse, the suicidal ideation, my fear of death. And... Uh, He's listening very sweetly on the other end of the phone, I assume. He goes, well, listen, do you folks know you need to come up here? I said, no, they haven't. I haven't spoke to them. He said, well, speak to them and call me tomorrow. But he has to talk to the abbot, Abbot Joseph. So I called the next day. He said, listen, Abbot Joseph would love to see you. When can he come up? So I come up on Friday. Meanwhile, I continue to drink and stuff, right? But I can't stop. So my mother and I drive up to Manchester, New Hampshire, and I, you know, when you travel from New York, you go through Connecticut, Massachusetts, and then New Hampshire, and the blues get bluer, the greens get greener, it's just nicer, the air smells better, your flowers, it's just a sweeter looking environment, and I think this is going to be good for me. So I got to St. Anselm, it's a beautiful campus, I become an administration builder, and I walk in, and I uh, meet Brother Philip, and uh he walks me to Abbot Joseph's office, and the Abbot Joseph says, Tommy, can I miss Cohen? Can I speak to Tommy first? And I go, yeah, we go in. And Abbot Joseph, he looked like Yoda, folks. He had the brown monk, the brown Benedictine robe on, little bald, round head, sweet guy. Probably the most compassionate-looking guy I've ever met in my life. He goes, Brother Philip told me your story. Would you mind telling me? And I tell him my story yet again, my second qualification as an alcoholic unbeknownst to me. 
And again, I am in the throes of panic and I'm fearful and I'm crying. And looking back, I'm begging for my life, begging for my life, thinking this is the solution. And he says, uh, you had a rough go of it, haven't you, son? I go, yeah, I guess I have. He goes, well, it's going to be okay. We have a spot for you. I'm floored. You got a spot for me? He goes, yeah. Started the start the Tuesday after Labor Day. So I want on mommy. I gotta I gotta come up here, blah blah blah. We're happy and blah blah blah. And two weeks later, I'm on his bus from the Port Authority and by the GW Bridge. I got a duffel bag full of underwear and T-shirts and my pro kids and a half a pound of weed. And I'm taking a bus to Manchester, New Hampshire, to save my life. Think about that. Now I get up there, and we know I'm the problem. I packed the problem. So I go up there and I see my classmates, man, and these are children. You know, they're doing something I had never, ever done in my life. They're doing age-appropriate things, man. They're 18 years old. They're just starting to date girls and they maybe have a beer or two in the pub. God forbid they smoke a cigarette. God forbid they smoke weed. And I am in the throes of my addiction. And I'm on Mars now. And... uh I continue to drink. I'm the problem. The geographic never worked. So about a month and a half into class, I'm having a nervous breakdown. My brain is screaming so loud, folks, so loud that I think if you're sitting next to me, you can hear it. The TV's talking to me. I'm paranoid. People across the quad are pointing at me and they're talking about me and I'm losing my mind. I go to brother Father Jude. Father Jude, can I come into the monastery? He goes, let me talk to the abbot. So I see him the next day. Abbot Joseph said, you come into the monastery for as long as you want, but in the monastery, you must do what we do. And it's a silent monastery. Every three hours, they engage in some sort of, what is it? Conscious contact with God. They pray. They meditate. They chant. They celebrate the Eucharist. They just sit in silent prayer. So I'm in and out to go to class. I can't go anywhere else. I got to go in and out to class. And I'm in the monastery. And 10 days later, my nervous breakdown is released. It is taken from me. Now, arrogant me, self-centered me, all-powerful me. Think I did it because I'm in my room going, oh, oh. What a fool. Now, why do I tell that story? You know, not one monk came over to me and said, Tanya, let's talk about your problem. Maybe I can help. Maybe we can talk through this suicidal ideation. Maybe we can talk through your your nervous breakdown. These monks intuitively know that God will do for me what I can't do for myself. And for Abbot Joseph, he said the same thing that you folks said to me when I walked in the rooms of AA in 2004. He said, it's going to be okay. Just do what we do. We have a chair for you. We have a place for you. That's exactly what AA did for me. So I graduate there and I marry my drinking partner. I continue to drink and drug with a nervous breakdown never came back. And I know in my heart of hearts that if I went in that monastery asking for my drug and alcohol to be released, it would have happened in 1974. And I'd be, I'd be talking to you with multiple decades under my belt. But I never knew alcohol was my problem. Never knew it. So I continued to drink and drug during college, and I did pretty well, and I applied to law school. I married my uh, college sweetheart. She's my drinking partner. We were married for about eight years. Uh, she leaves. She goes back to Portland, Maine. I'm in the Bronx. She goes into AA, and she's got about 45 years of sobriety. I'd say good for her. She was a drunk. But I was the same mess. I was in the same bottle of mess that she was. And I continue to drink and drug. And uh, I go into the rooms of AA in the early 80s and in the early 90s. And I walked in because she had a problem. I walked in because I was told I had a problem. I don't remember hearing a word you folks said. I was given a big book. I never opened it. I just took your coffee, ate some of your stale Oreos. And I got what I put in, absolutely nothing. And I kept burning that house down. And uh, I make it up to law school. And again, my drinking and drugging is insane. 
But I get through law school, I do pretty well up in law school, but again, how could I be an alcoholic if I'm achieving these things in my life? And I hear that's a common refrain. How could I be? Look at the degrees on my wall. I got a house. I got two cars. Come on. You know, I get up most of, most days. I get to work most of the time. You know, I pay my bills somewhat regularly. How could I be? I wasn't given the information. I didn't want the information. And um, I can continue to burn the house down. I get married a second time. We get married a second time, and we get married within four months of meeting one another. Again, she's my drinking and drug partner, beautiful English woman. And we had a child. When the child was two years old, she had an intervention for me in my big house up in Yorktown Heights. I got a two-acre lot, big, beautiful house. How could I be an alcoholic? But I ain't coming home. I'm outside the marriage, spending money crazy, build our side of stack up. How could I be? I got a beautiful baby. Never saw it. Alcohol is insidious, insidious. And uh, she has an intervention for me, and uh, I go away. I go to Arms Acres. I was there for 28 days. And I listen a little bit. I listen a little bit, and I'm, I'm more concerned about doing my push-ups, you know, eating right, getting my health back together, my, my teeth, my gums stopped bleeding. Finally had a solid stool after God knows how long. <laughs> and... Uh, I come out of I come out of arms acres and I feel good, uh, but I don't change. You know, I'm still dancing outside the marriage. I'm not drinking a drug, and but I'm told at the uh, by my counselor, Miss Patricia, Tommy, you got to pick a home group. You got to get a home group, and you got to go to every home group meeting. Okay. So back in the day, they had the paper books, right? And I'm very fortunate in New York. You can throw a softball from anywhere you're standing in New York and hit 15 meetings. It's just that they're everywhere. But I'm going through the book. Well, oh, that meeting four times a week. It's three, that, four times. That's great. Seven days a week. I picked the Henry Hudson group. Henry Hudson makes one day a week, Wednesdays. That's my home group. Uh, it's just insane. You now you look back at the insanity. I just come out of rehab. I was put into rehab because my family thought I was a danger to myself and to others, and I ain't taking this shit seriously. So I'm good. So I go to Henry Hudson, you know, and I go there for about a year and every Wednesday, and I get there right in the middle of the preamble and leave it in the middle of the Our Father. I don't meet nobody. I don't pick up the book. I don't do anything you guys are saying. I don't even remember hearing much of what you said. And a year later, I go back out, and I'm out for another 10 years. Burning the house down. We get divorced the second time. Good. You never should have got married in the first place. <laughs> Unbelievable. And I continue my merry ways, and I, I continue to drink and drug. And sometimes I get some sobriety. I get a couple of couple of months without a drink. You know, ninety days here. You, you know, but nothing long standing. You can always stop. You can't stay stopped. I found out you can't stay stopped without a program. But in May of 2004, well, in 2022, a girlfriend who I had been dating, my drinking partner, she moves out of my house, my apartment, because I'm drinking and drugging and getting crazy. She moves out and she goes into AA. She's got about a year's sobriety. And I'm outside my local gin mill, the pipe is tilt, 230th and Broadway. Beautiful, beautiful drinking hole. And uh, I'm out there on a Saturday afternoon. I got a nose full of candy, a belly full of whiskey, smoking a cigarette, and my hat on crooked. And uh, no, I don't smoke. I don't, I don't, I don't speak Spanish. But we're doing what we're doing. And she drives by, folks. She drives by and she sees me. She rolls down the window. And she goes, hey, Tommy. Hey, baby, how you doing? And she gives me a look, Amy. She gives me a look like sad. She goes, Tommy, what are you going to do? Goes, what do you mean? I said, Tommy, what are you going to do? I said, I want to go with you. So she calls me into her car and she gives me a kiss. She gives me a kiss that to this day changed my life because we never rekindled our romantic relationship, but she gave me a kiss that told me that she at least thought I was worth it. Because somewhere deep inside of every alcoholic is a death wish. You know, the death wish, but it's slowly committing suicide. 
So my last drink was actually October 2003, and I go into the, uh, I go into the dry, sobriety, right? I don't go back into the rooms. So how can I go back? It's gonna be so embarrassing to go back. I'll just stop drinking. You know what that does, right? You get, you get miserable. And uh, May of '04, I'm miserable. Uh, I'm not going into bars, and I'm just coming home, and and I'm losing my mind. I'm just a sad, broken guy. Very popular man, but a very sad, broken fellow, spiritually spent. So I decided to go back to the Henry Hudson group. Those guys were good, man. I wonder if they're still there. <laughs> Think of the arrogance, right? I wonder if they're still there. So I decided to go back on that Wednesday night. And I, another piece of insanity. Here I am, shattered. And I decided to go back to AA, but God forbid I get there early. Again, again, I walk in the middle of the preamble. I want to get help. I want to get better. I know you guys have some answers, but God forbid I get there early. But I'll tell you what happened. Johnny M. I made eye contact with this man. And I started to cringe. <laughs> As I walked in, he pulled the chair. I goes, how you doing? My name's John. How you doing, Tom? He goes, let's talk after the meeting. Oh, no. That. Think of the insanity of that. I go in looking for some salvation. And a man puts his hand out. Pull me out, pull me into the boat, and I'm like cringing. So I sit through the entire meeting, not hearing a word anybody said, and I'm worried about what I'm going to say to this. No. That's my bell for the St. Francis prayer. Goes off every day at 12 30. Uh, so after the meeting, a bunch of guys are sitting outside the meeting hall right there, just chatting and just talking. They ain't, they ain't hit me with the big book. They ain't smacking me. They're not even talking to me, per se. They're just having a chat, like what's happening at work. And how about the Yankees, blah, blah, blah. And then they turn to me and they go, Tommy, where are you going tomorrow night? Now, I got nowhere to go, folks. I said, I don't know, man. I'm a little busy. I'll see what's happening. I don't know. He goes, well, we're going to go to Henry, the uh, Riverdale group. Meets right across the street, 6.30, Bell, meet us at 6.00. Oh, I'll see what I can do. Maybe I'll meet you over there. I got nowhere to go. But I show up. I get there at 6 o'clock, and they remember me, and I remember some of them, and we go into the meeting, and I see something in that meeting that I had never seen before in any of my incarnations through AA. I see these men with some time actually listening to the speaker, actually listening to the shares around the room. And I said to myself, what a profound idea. And I start listening. What happens when you listen, right? You learn a few things about your drinking. I learned from hearing your experiences. And I heard how bad people had it. How they found a way out of the hole. And how their lives had changed for the better. Like, wow. But after that, me and Ralph Cyber were all chatting. They go, where are you going tomorrow night? And my first thought was, Glenn, my first thought was, three meetings in a row? Really, fellas? You're a hobby, man. Are you crazy? But again, I got nowhere to go. So we're going to meet at Down to Earth. It's a Manhattan College basement. 7.30, Bell, meet us at 7. I get there at 7 o'clock. I know some of them. Hey, Tommy, good to see you. And we're bullshitting or back and forth. And they're talking to me. And I'm, in, I'm involved. And we go down to the meeting. And there's a speaker. And I listen. And it goes around for this year. And I put my hand up as if I got something to say. And I prattle on some nonsense for I don't know how long, and they kind of did a pretty good job. <laughs> After the meeting, it's about 150 people in the room. After the meeting, I see this older chap, Jimmy Byrne. I didn't know him at the time. He starts making his way across the hall. And I get the impression he's coming over to see me, and my first thought was, he's going to give me a pat on the back. He's going to ask me to share somewhere else, because I got so much profound information this year. And a man walks over to me and he goes, how you doing? My name's Jimmy Burns. He goes, you know, we need guys like you in the room. You're sharp, you dress well, you speak well. But he leaned into me, folks, and excuse my language. He goes, you don't know a fucking thing about getting sober, so maybe you should listen more. Amy, I did not laugh. I was like shocked. 
but I did not get a resentment. I said, it rang so true. And, and I said, this man, who knew everybody in the room, made a path to me to give me some information that he thought may save my life. And I said, okay, okay, can I have your number? He goes, no, I don't get my number out. He turned around, he walked away. <laughs> But Jimmy and I were dear friends ever since, man. So I started listening. And after that meeting, Tommy, where are you going tomorrow night? I said, I don't know, man. I guess I'm going with you guys. Said, now you're talking. And we went down to the Marble Hill Group. And I met Marge. Marge had about 35 years of sobriety, a little beautiful Margie. She said, she told my story. She told my story. Word for word. And I listened. I started listening. I started turning around to people in the room. So we sharing. I would turn around and look at everybody sharing. And I picked up some information about drinking and how they got sober and about the big book. Wow. And after that, they said, we're going to go to the confidence group on Saturday. So the fellowship, man, these men, strangers in my life. Oh, the first paragraph of the preamble. Primary purpose is stay sober and help another alcoholic achieve sobriety. It was helping me achieve sobriety by saying, come along with us, jump in the boat, bro, grab an oar. Stop your whining. Just roll. You got nowhere else to go. And they got me into the rooms at Bronx Circuit. I was going to meetings every night. And what did I hear in the rooms? But those five things, those five things that I live by today. Don't drink a day at a time. No matter what happens in your world, do not pick up a drink. Do not pick up a drink. Pick up the phone before you pick up a drink. Pick up the phone before you pick up a, you know, a little bump. Pick up the phone. Don't pick up a drink. But that'll send you right back. <clears throat> then they said, got to go to meetings. I said, okay, I'm going to go to meetings. I enjoyed going to meetings. I heard people say, you don't have an hour for a meeting. You used to sit in a bar for six hours. Stop. Stop. And it sounds so true. It sounded so ridiculous. I don't have time for a meeting. And these guys had me in a meeting. It was a fun group of men. And I met more people. And I would go. And they said, you got to get a home group. I had a home bar, I had a home team, I had a home school. Home, home group sounds, yeah, why not? Sounds perfectly right. Go to somewhere where people know your name. You know, go there where you're accountable. So I joined the Henry Hudson group, and then I met my sponsor, Pete Baker. God rest his soul. Pete Baker made me, uh, he said, service is important. You're going to be the greeter. But me and big, arrogant self, I said, greeter? Well, you're not more important. Can't you make me like a treasurer or something? He goes, no, 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 no. You're going to be the greeter. You're going to be a good one. You're going to get here a half hour before the meeting starts. You're going to help the man set up the chairs, and you're going to say hello to every man and woman who walks through that door and greet him with a smile. Welcome to the Henry Hudson Group of Alcohol Anonymous. Walkies over there, bathrooms upstairs, downstairs, blah, blah, blah. If they're new to the meeting, introduce them to a woman or a man. That's what you do, and I love that job. I think it's the best gig in Alcohol Anonymous to this day, being the greeter. And then what did Pete do? You got a big book? So yeah, I got one somewhere. Yeah, that's what I thought. So he gave, he gave me another big book and he says to me, I want you to read the stories in the back. It's about 12164. I heard that's the that's the meat of the program. He said, Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. We'll get to that. But I want you to read the stories in the back. I didn't know there were stories in the back. So I read the stories. Some of them I read with Pete. And I heard some stories. I read some stories of horrible, horrible lives that alcohol destroyed. Great lives that were destroyed by alcohol, I should say. And then I read how they got better by coming into the room and following the five simple suggestions, going through the steps. And I heard about this, how their life was reclaimed, redeemed, glorified, sanctified. I said, wow, maybe me. Maybe I can get there too. The Pete, I finished that. I finished all the stories. Okay, now I want you to read the uh, doctor's opinion. I said, Pete, can we get the one through one sixty? Read the doctor's opinion. Where's that? It's in the Roman numerals. Oh, I didn't know about that. You know what I mean? I never read the instructions. So I read the doctor's opinion. And I say that changed my life. Doctor's opinion changed my life. It took a big burden off my shoulders. I always thought that my inability to stop drinking was a willpower issue, that I lacked willpower. I wasn't man enough to say no. 
I also thought I had a moral failing. I was an immoral man at my core. Nothing to do with morality. I had a disease, a threefold disease. Phenomenon of craving, the inability to stop once I start. I said, wow. Wow. How do I get better? He said, that's where 1 through 164 comes in. <laughs> I tell you, man, it was such... I, it, that's what all my sponsors used to do it that way, too. So we start doing it, right? We start doing the steps. We read the Bill story and agnostics, and there is a solution. More about alcoholism. How it works. Imagine that. Step-by-step step and step-by-step step instructions. Even a big shot lawyer could understand. Unbelievable. So we were powerless. Yeah, I'm powerless, man. Once I start, I can't stop. I'd be able to swear on a stack of Bibles on my way home up to Deegan. I'm going to stop in and the pipe is killed. I'm going to have two buds and a burger. Be home by 9 o'clock. That's it. Two buds, burger, home. I'd walk in, Pete. Two buds, order me a cheeseburger to go. Make it a blue cheeseburger. Fuck the burger, man, Pete. Give me a shot of Jameson's. At 11 o'clock, I call a man. Just stunning. Time and time again. And I really believe that. I could. I, I believe I was only going for two beers. So yeah, I'm powerless over alcohol. He, he told me, to just look at your record time. I don't look at my record. Don't look at anyone else's. Look at your record. How many times did you say not tonight and you drank anyway? Alcohol made the decision for you. I go, how about that? So one wasn't that hard for me. You have to explain to me that I'm powerless over alcohol. And powerless does not mean you're weak. It means that you made a strong decision. You just come over to the winning team. You made a decision to go over to the winning team. How about that? Yeah. I put down my firearms and went over to the winning team. Hands up, I surrender. I had a posse around me, man. I knew my life was unmanageable. Then he said, a group of drunk. Then he says, uh, I came to believe that a power greater than me can restore me to sanity. Now, I'm born and raised Roman Catholic. But I thought Jesus was that good-looking guy in the Easter movies. You know? The nice hair, the conditioned, well-conditioned hair, and a nice beard. Spoke beautiful. He had beautiful teeth, too. Jesus. <laughs> I had no idea he could intervene in my daily life. So I had a hard time figuring out who Jesus was. But he said, Tommy, and it dawned on me, the group of drunks, God, group of drunks, you folks know how to stay sober. You folks know how to stay I don't. I'm going to make you my, I'm going to come to bed. You can help me. And I turned my life over in will to the group of drunks in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous until I established a God of my understanding and I returned back to the baby Jesus. Early on, a group of drunks was my higher power. Four and five was not as scary as I thought it was going to be. Sounds scary. I had to tell all that air, all that dirty laundry out. My sponsor said, Tommy, you know what you did. It ain't so scary to you. God knows what he did. He sees it all. And I'm telling you, Tommy, if you did it, I did it. And he told me his story. And I went, oh. Do most drunks do that? Yeah, most drunks do what you just did. So don't worry about that. Just get it out of the content. Spit it up. It's like the bad worm. Spit it up. You're going to feel better. Spit it up. Clean out the attic. So in the big boxes, little by little, we go into the back of the attic, the little boxes, all that dusty stuff that you're afraid to look at. And we'll get rid of it. And I told him my story in the fifth step. And it wasn't that bad. I thought it would be horrible. I said, what was I so damn worried about? And he goes, that's what I said too, Tommy. What was I so worried about? And I felt better. Then we hit six and seven. Character defects. Character defects used to be my support staff. You know, you rely on those to help you get through a day. You know, lying and cheating, deceiving and holding back and sins of omission and commission. He's a support staff for me for the longest time, but they didn't serve me well. So I had to ask God to help me with those on a daily basis, and I still do. Shortcomings, what should you do and you didn't do? What could you do better that you didn't do as well? And again, I look at those every single day. And I try to do better. But the point of my sobriety is for me to be a gracious citizen of the world. I have to sit home with my laurels and just be, oh, I ain't drinking no more. I got to go forth and be the big book to somebody. That's what I was told. And I do that, try to do that humbly. Then we went to 8 9. 8 9 was a big scary monster, too. I got to write down everybody who harmed me or I harmed. Holy moly. I was almost as bad as going through step four. 
but the same thing is that put put their names to the to the uh, transgressions. And then Pete and I just spoke, spoke about how we make amends. Critically important that you speak to your sponsor before you make the amends. Is it appropriate? Am I saying it correctly? What's my intent? What's my motive? Is it going to harm them? Is it going to injure them? And we had a long discussion on some of my amends. And I agree with everything he said. And I made the amends to the best of my ability. And they still come up every now and then. Something pops up. Those deep recesses of your brain. Oh my God, I remember that now. And you talk to your sponsor. You say, what should I do? Well, they're around. Maybe you want to reach out to them. But if they're not, write a letter to them. You know? Just acknowledge it. People need to have, a, have the harms acknowledged. And then 10, you know? Spot inventory every single day. I know when I don't do something right. I know when I don't hold the door for somebody because I'm in a damn rush. That's just inappropriate. If I cut somebody off on a highway, that ain't right. You know, if I look at somebody and have a, neat, like a nasty thought about their outfit or their size, that ain't appropriate. Got to make a spot inventory. My mama died about eight years ago, and uh, she was a saintly woman. And uh, she taught me right from wrong. So every night before I go to bed, I do my daily inventory, and I always say, Mommy, how did I do today? And oftentimes, more times than not, she says, you did it okay, Tommy. And I get a gold star from my refrigerator. Sometimes she says, Tommy, you're a little short on that last that, um, that one that one incident. You got to think about that. Maybe do something about it. I say, okay, Mom. Step 11, prayer and meditation. Through my conscious contact. That's what those monks taught me. And I remember reading the big book, and I read those lines, God will do for you what you can't do for yourself. No human power can relieve the malady. And I say, wow. That happened in 1974. I didn't even know it. God relieved my nervous breakdown. I went in and asked him. I went into a house of a cleric, his home. And I started to believe. And I believe I made Jesus my higher power. Good ethical fellow. And then 12, lend a hand, man. That which was so graciously given to me, I must give away. And not just to people in the room. Be kind and gracious to everyone you meet. Be a kind, gracious citizen. You know, if we believe in the Our Father, that means we're all brothers and sisters. You know? We're all brothers and sisters. I want to be good to my family members. An alcohol anonymous man changed my life. Changed my life. I uh, I got sober in 2004. I was able to travel to a bunch of uh, you know different conventions around the country and around the world. I'll be going to Vancouver in 2025. I met some lovely people. I'm uh, I'm blessed to be on this Zoom meeting. Uh, all my all I can I think all my friends are in the rooms of Alcohol Anonymous. The best people I have met in my life. Or members who carry this program in their heart and in their actions on a daily basis. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. And I thank God every morning for the grace that he has bestowed upon me to keep me away from a drink a day at a time. And there's a price to pay for that. I got to be a good son to him. I got to be a good brother to you, Michael, and a good brother to you, Amy, and Bill, and Jeffrey. And uh, that's what that, that's my obligation in this world. And uh, you know, when I'm I'm at home, you know everything's good in my house. Nobody, I have no wind coming. But when I leave my house in the morning, you know the public's out there. People on the road, people in the elevator, people on the street, vendors, retailers. You know, and I uh, I walk out with my mother on my left, and I have Jesus on my right. Because if those two folks are walking with me. I'll know I'll behave like a good guy. I'll hold the door. I'll say yes. I'll say please. I'll say thank you. I'll say you're welcome. I won't litter. I won't shoplift. I won't drive like a maniac. I'll answer my phone calls. I'll put an honest day working for an honest day's pay. And I'll fulfill my obligation to Alcohols Anonymous. 
I don't think I've ever said no to anyone in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. To the best of my ability, I will help. And if I can't, I will find someone who can. And that's the name of this game, man. And, uh, I'm blessed to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, the world's greatest, the largest gang in the world. And I thank God for the Zoom platform to open up the world to me. And to realize that, man, we are everywhere. We're like, the, we're like, like that, what was that movie, The Pods? Remember the pods? You walk down the street and you see somebody, he's in AA. I recently got married and I call up this uh, right there. I'm at the boat on the Hudson River and the woman who runs the management company for the boat, I go to meet her and they're going to arrange the affair and uh, I hear her say some things. You, know, you ever do that? Do you hear people talk the language? You know? And I said to her, I'm looking at her, and she's got a nice spirit about her, and she's looking at me like, yeah. I said, are you a friend of Bill? He goes, absolutely, and I know you are. I go, how's that? Well, we just know each other, and it's amazing how God put us together. And uh, we've become dear friends. I shared at her meeting on 96th Street about four months ago, and uh, just blessed. Absolutely blessed to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I want to thank you all for being on board here for today and hearing my little story. I hope it helps somebody. Thank you very much, Glenn. Lots of love to you.